my lovely, lovely imps. Today, it comes at last. I promised you all that I was going to do a full review of Dragon's Dogma 2. If you haven't seen my first impressions video, it's on my channel, very easy to find. I'll put it in the description down below, but go check it out. Um, I did a first impressions video after playing somewhere in the ballpark of 20 hours. And then I promised that I was going to do a full review of Dragon's Dogma 2 once I beat the game. Well, it's happened. I beat the game. And I beat the game with a fairly high level of completion, actually. Um, I did a lot of the stuff in the game. And I have just so many thoughts about Dragon's Dogma 2. And uh, if you haven't seen my first impressions video, it's a good idea to watch it, watch it first so you can see how my approach and opinions changed from the first 20 hours to when I had become a grizzled veteran of Dragon's Dogma 2 at the uh, somewhere around almost 100 hours um, mark. Played a lot of Dragon's Dogma 2. Let's talk about it. So Dragon's Dogma 2 um, is obviously uh, a sequel, but it is a sequel to a cult game. A game that was incredibly, incredibly popular within a certain niche. A game that was not really a AAA game, and now its new version is almost inarguably a AAA game, made with a large budget by a major studio. And um, it had a, a pretty ambitious you know, task in front of it. Um, the, the hype for the game was unreal. I was very surprised by just how much attention Dragon's Dogma 2 was getting online. Um, but also, the director of the game um, was sort of going around and doing interviews with some major magazines in advance of the game that got it a lot of attention for some of the bold claims that were made. And I'm going to talk about those in a few minutes. Um, in my opinion, having played a decent chunk of Dragon's Dogma 1 and now played all of Dragon's Dogma 2, you do not need to play Dragon's Dogma 1 in order to enjoy Dragon's Dogma 2. But you should probably just go play Dragon's Dogma 1 for a number of reasons. Mostly because it's really fun. And I had a lot of fun with Dragon's Dogma 1. And I have to say, I think that Dragon's Dogma 2 failed to follow up on the sheer innovative and unique level uh, um, that Dragon's Dogma 1 was operating on. But I'll get into all that in a second. There are going to be spoilers in this review, but the type of spoilers that I'm going to be doing are illustrative for the purposes of this, and they're not going to, hopefully, completely spoil the experience. Um, most of what is going to be spoiled is going to be the story, and I wouldn't worry too much about that for reasons that I'm going to get into. Um, the greatest part of Dragon's Dogma 2 has nothing to do, it cannot be spoiled, okay? So don't worry about listening to this review and feeling like you're going to, you know, that things are going to be ruined for you. It's impossible for me to ruin the parts of Dragon's Dogma 2 that are good. Um... So don't stress that too much, but there will be spoilers in this review just in case it's it's particularly important to you. Anyway, let's get into this. Dragon's Dogma 2 is an RPG. It is an action uh, uh, game that has RPG elements and the sort of core feature that Dragon's Dogma brought to the table that very few other games have done is this system called the Pawn System. The pawn system is uh, really, really amazing. And uh, it, in my opinion, it only got better in Dragon's Dogma 2 with very few exceptions. The pawn system is a system by which you make your own little custom sidekick, basically. They're a NPC uh, that helps you in battle carries your stuff for you, follows you around through the entire game, and gets up to all kinds of hijinks. And what's really special about the pawn system is that um, there's a ton of options, first of all, for their personalities, but more importantly, 
you can share your pawn with other people and other people's pawns can be shared with you. Which means when you're playing the game, chances are you're going to have a party full of other people's pawns mixing and hanging out with and talking back and forth with your pawn. And those people's pawns can carry knowledge from, their, from another game that they played with another pl person to your game. So an example, you bring a pawn into your world from somebody who's already done the quest that you are on right now, and that pawn might say, Arisen, I have information about this quest that could help you. And then you can press a little button and it'll and that pawn can tell you information about the quest. Or sometimes they'll just say, I don't think we're going to find what we're looking for here, my lord. Kind of amazing. I love it. It's kind of beautiful. The pawn system is incredible. And um, that's one of the biggest things that this game has to... Uh, that the Dragon's Dogma series brings to the table. And let me tell you, Dragon's Dogma 2 did an absolutely amazing job uh, adding more and, and infusing the pawn system with love. In fact, I think that the pawn system is perhaps my favorite thing in the entire game. Uh, all the way through, from the beginning to the end, 100 hours somewhere in the ballpark, of gameplay and the pawn system was still entertaining to me all the way to the end. I had multiple pawns that there were other people's pawns that I added to my uh, party that I ended up keeping for a really long time. One such example was a pawn named A2 which was modeled to look just like the character from Nier named A2. So this was, somebody had made a character from another game, put it into the pawn system, and I brought that pawn into my party and adventured with that pawn for a really long time. And it was, it was awesome, okay? It was fantastic. They remade A2, looked just like the character from, from Nier. Uh, and I, in fact, I think that that pawn was the, uh, and I'll tell you about this, at the end of the game, they do a little stats screen while the credits are rolling, and they show you the pawns that you adventured the longest with. And my number one pawn was A2, and my number two pawn was this unbelievably yoked mage by the name of Klaus, okay? I had somebody made this, this sorcerer pawn whose name was Klaus, and he was sick, okay? This guy was dripped up. He had face tats, he had a little crown, he had jewelry, he had this red robe that was flowing all over the place. The guy was sick, okay? And also, he had the most overpowered magic. The person who, who made this pawn stacked him up with the best spells that you could possibly unlock for Sorcerer. So this pawn completely was wrecking monsters for me. It was incredible. And I kept him in my party for like, I don't know, a, like a quarter of the game time played. It was amazing, okay? It was incredible. Klaus, you were a real one. A2, you were a real one. And I loved that at the end of the game that it shows your pawns and they're doing their little animations and you get to see them as like your number one companion. And it's like, a2 doing like cool moves with her sword and then it's like Klaus and he's like Whoosh! excellent amazing touch okay pawn system beautiful you get attached to these wonderful creatures they have unique interactions they've all because there's so many different personalities you can choose there's like there's like five overarching personalities and then the pawns learn stuff and they change slightly as they go through the game so there's like a lot of variety in the ways the pawns can approach. And it's very funny because sometimes you'll get a pawn who's a total asshole. Let's just put it that way, okay? You'll get a pawn that's constantly talking down to you or whatever or insulting the other pawns. And other times you'll get a pawn that's a total pushover sweetheart. It's The variety is great. And the way that the pawns interact with each other is just so much fun in this game. Um... And of course, you know, I mentioned the comparison to Dragon's Dogma 1, which I'm going to do a couple times throughout this lengthy review. Um, but uh, 
there is a lot more variety of lines, dialogue, spontaneid, spont spontaneous dialogue, all kinds of stuff like that than the first game. The second game has a lot more. So uh, you will still hear from time to time repeated lines, sometimes lines that you hear way too often, but it's much better than <laughs> Dragon's Dogma 1. In Dragon's Dogma 1, soaked to the bone! Wolves hunt in packs arisen! Be careful arisen! Like those lines, there is aught here! Like you would hear those lines so goddamn much. Soaked to the bone! Soaked to the bone! Wolves hunt in packs arisen! God, like every 10 seconds, wolves hunt in packs arisen! That guy wasn't a pawn. People are talking about the masterworks all can't go wrong. That guy is not a pawn. That's just a normal shopkeeper that you have to go to a hundred thousand times. Um, but the uh, pawn lines were, there were not as many pawn lines in Dragon's Dogma 1 as there are in Dragon's Dogma 2. Uh, you still get some repeats, but it's not nearly as bad. Um, anyway, the, the pawn system is perhaps my favorite part of Dragon's Dogma 2. And that alone had me still having fun all the way to the end of my playthrough. Um, I want to talk about the other things that I loved about Dragon's Dogma 2 first, before I get into anything else. Um, the uh, other thing that I really like about Dragon's Dogma 2 is the wackiness factor that is present in the combat all the way through the game. There is an approach to combat, and in fact, I wish that they would have leaned even more into it, um, that there's just this goofiness to the... I shouldn't call it goofy, because it's not It's not really, like, f like, silly. It's not like, you know, there's funny noises or anything. It's wacky, okay? It's just unpredictable, weird things that happen. I, An example that I talked about in my... Um, in my first little first impressions video was um, my pawn at one point going, I'll save you master and flinging herself off of a, off of a cliff onto the head of an ogre, which immediately toppled over into a river, killing both of them immediately. Just like that type of stuff happens so frequently. And uh, I love it. There are uh, there are monsters that can pick you up and throw you and you'll just go like rolling across and land somewhere else. You might even land in another group of enemies. Um, the, the, the wacky aspect of combat is so great. There are times where a giant enemy will chase you into a tiny location and it will barely be able to move. It'll be struggling. Uh, it's struggling and it'll be chaotic and it's ridiculous. There are, um, there's these lizards in the game that one of their moves is that they roll up into a ball and they like sonic roll themselves at you. And if you step out of the way, they'll just go flying. So sometimes you'll hear like a grumbling noise and you could just like speed up by sprinting real quick and a lizard will just like, like hot wheels launch itself off of a cliff into the distance. There <coughs> There is a spell that you can get um, for, uh, or a, a skill that you can get as warriors, which is like the big two-handers, where you can like wind up like a baseball style strike and you can knock an enemy into the distance and they literally like fly off and disappear. You don't, if you kill an enemy like that, you don't get treasure and you don't get experience. You just get the joy of baseball home run batting an enemy off into the foreign distance. It's, it's, absolutely incredible okay um <laughs> it's great the wacky aspect is amazing i love it oh another example of this there's a spell in the game that lets you summon a tornado and it picks up enemies and turns them into physics objects so you can crash enemies into each other and with the tornado you can basically scoop up a bunch of goblins and and if an ogre is there, the goblins will be getting pelted. Their their bodies will be getting pelted into the ogre or into the dragon or whatever else you're fighting. Awesome. Okay, truly awesome. So that's that's the other thing that I really love about this game. Um, and, oh, oh my God, I want to talk about one more thing. There's another thing you can do in the game, which is you can pick up enemies that are prone or dead and throw them at each other. 
And you can make enemies hit each other mid-air. I have picked up a, a, a stunned goblin and thrown him at another goblin that was doing a jump attack at me, had them collide in the air, and both of them die. Awesome. Just amazing. I love it. Oh my god. Just that feels so cool and is very funny. Okay? So there's one more thing that I truly love about the game, and I wanted to I wanna I wanna talk about it, which is the fashion, okay? And I'm gonna show you some pictures of my character throughout the game because I love the fashion in this game so very much, okay? And I have a lot of, so I wanna show you where my character started, okay? Real quick, here's my character, all right? First of all, isn't she beautiful? She's beautiful, she's strong, she's ripped. She looks amazing. Doesn't she look incredible? This is where she started, okay? Amazing starting drip. Very simple, but, but a, a, a aesthetically pleasing staff. Cool little scale crown, feathery feathers on the shoulders. We got her little serpentine bracelets and this little gem studded thing, okay? Amazing, right, okay? Well, it just keeps getting better because as the game goes on, I had so many different incredible outfits. My God. So here was one of my, oh, let me get a, let me get a nice shot of this one, okay? Hold on, let me get this one up here, all right? Here we go. Here's my pawn as an archer with some, uh, as you can see, we got a little bit of uh, World of Warcraft shoulder plate going on here. But I've got like a thorn bow, this big, really attractive red quiver, matching red suit. I've got an over-the-shoulder cape here. I've got like a little bit of like this uh, sort of chainmail type stuff going on here. No more, uh, no more crown. This is as a, with an archer outfit, okay? And I got more. It's gonna keep go keep going. Here, of course, is one of my favorite pictures from the entire game. <laughs> Hold on, let me let me show you the one. All right. Here we go. Here we go. One of my favorite screenshots I got. This is me holding the A2 pawn, by the way. This is, I think, the only screenshot I got of the A2 pawn. <laughs> this is with that same out, or, oh no, I slightly modified this outfit. So you can see now I've got a different, uh, slightly different top on, carrying the A2 pawn. And down here in the corner, you can see Yoda. Yoda's over here. There's a, there's a zoomed out picture where we can see Yoda a little bit closer. There's Yoda wearing a wolf hat and a wolf fur leggings and a wolf fur cloak. And this this is another pawn we've got. As you can see, she's got like sort of golden wings. Great. The, the fashion is amazing. But I'm not done yet. I want to show you some of my other amazing fashions through the game. Are you guys ready for it to get kicked into ultimate level? All right. Are you ready for the, the absolute, the most incredible drip of the entire game, perhaps? Check this. Look at this. God damn, what a sick outfit. I've got the this this smoking sensor. I've got this uh, leather strap outfit with the over-the-shoulder feathers, with the multi-eye veil hood. You get these sh no shoulders puffy sleeves that swing behind you that have golden eyes embroidered on the inside of the sleeve. Look at this. The detail in these outfits are amazing. Just so, the inside of the sleeves has golden eyes. What? Oh, just incredible. Okay, but I got more, okay? I've got even more outfits. Take a look at this one. Take a look at my late game archer drip, okay? Oh no, wait, this was actually as a mystic spear hand, not archer. Here's me carrying one of my wives. That's right, you can have many lovers in these games, which is impressive. Incredible. I've got the dark leather up here with the, with the green and gold straps. I have a golden laurels matching the green and gold here, matching the green and gold here with the dark red, reddish brown leather. Incredible. Just amazing. And of course, hold on, let me show you my later game stuff, the, my actual late game stuff. Hold on, let me get this one up for you. 
Wait, do we got the shot? Let me find it. Oh yeah, here's just a really cool cinematic shot. Okay, this doesn't show the whole drip, but you can see my character, how she looks towards the end of the game. I've got silver feathers on one end, like real feathers on the other, the silver armor, the mask that's got the black and white pattern, and this, this little diadem or whatever this is. Incredible. But hold on, let me get you the full shot so you can see the whole outfit. Where is that one? That is here. Here's the full outfit. No, wait, this is not with the silver. This is with before I switched to the silver armor. Here we go. There's the one with the silver armor. Unfortunately, the lighting is kind of fucked up here. But you can see the full end game drip. I've got, uh, I've got leg. The 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 leg piece is blood rune wraps. So I have like cloths with red blood runes written on them, wrapped all around my legs. Actually amazing. With this, by the way, you can't see this because these are just screenshots. But this mask shimmers. So these patterns on the mask, they change, they shift over it. It keeps constantly moving. That, that white and black pattern moves across the mask when it's in the real actual gameplay. Really, really amazing. Okay. The fashion in this game, I think I've shown just, and that's, I'm showing you a tiny selection of the available outfit options in this game. It is, the, 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 the armor choices are amazing. There are so many good ones. Oh, actually I actually have one more to show. Here we go. This was the one that I used before I got that silver armor. This is a, uh, a rare end game dress. It's, it's, it's made with dragon scales and black leather. You've got like these little winged eyes on the belt, golden big bracelets. And a little top here that's got this like scale go thing going on. Actually incredible the amount of outfits that you can do in Dragon's Dogma 2. And I wanted to give a lot of attention to it because it deserves praise. I love fashion in games and this game really hits the spot. The outfits are very different for each of the classes. And they look, they're, they're just, they're mix and matchable. You can make your own custom outfits. You don't have to stick to sets. Um, the sets blend well with one another. It's really, really, really cool. So that's what I love about Dragon's Dogma. And now I'm gonna talk about some of the things that I like about Dragon's Dogma. And then we're gonna talk into my critiques of Dragon's Dogma 2. Um, because there's a lot to talk about there. And I want to make this as f complete and and full of a review as possible. Um, yeah. Anyway, let's talk about what I like. So, this game has a really cool day-night cycle. There is a lot of differences between exploring the world during the day and exploring the world at night. Uh, not just visibility, but the types of enemies that appear and the frequency of enemies, in addition to where people are in the game world, changes. Um, the the NPCs have totally different cycles at night and may completely d become inaccessible as they go into their houses or whatever at nighttime versus at day. The day-night cycle, there's a lot of love put into the day-night cycle and a lot of attention was paid into the experience of navigating at night um, navigating at night is very dangerous. It's very hard to see. Um, but there are some advantages. And this is what, what's really, really cool. At nighttime, treasures of certain types glow. Fairly brightly, in fact. Which means, while it is significantly harder to find your way around the environment, and there are way more enemies that are stronger, enemies get stronger at night, you can actually find certain treasures significantly easier if you're exploring an area that you know at night. So if you get the familiarity, if you get familiarity with an area during the daytime and then you revisit that area at night, you might find a lot of stuff that's fairly valuable to you um, or could be fairly valuable to you at the nighttime. Uh, additionally, there is a real sense of peril 
uh, especially in the like first third of the game when you're traveling at night. If you're traveling at night, you are going to be getting attacked. There is a lot more enemies at night and you cannot see very far, which means the likelihood of you being ambushed by something pretty scary uh, goes way up. The day-night cycle, I really like it. There's also, which something that ties into this, is a camping system. There are camp sites all over the world that you can use. They're fairly plentiful. Um, and you can camp at a campsite and eat a meal, uh, restore your lost HP, because in this game, when you lose HP, a certain percentage of the damage is taken as permanent HP loss until you rent until you rest again, which means that you got to rest at some point because otherwise your HP bar is just going to keep getting smaller and smaller as you get more tired. Um, and that means that this camping system is fairly important. You can also pass time when you're at a camp, uh, but there's a percentage chance of you getting ambushed when you camp. And getting ambushed is no good. If you get ambushed, you don't get to restore the stuff that you needed and you can lose some of your camping materials, which means that you're incentivized to choose between different camping materials, which are more advantageous in different areas. There is a certain type of camping gear that is good in the forest and makes you harder to detect versus stuff that you'd use in the desert. Um, really cool. Camping system works great, feels good, gives you a, a sort of punctuation to your adventures where, okay, I've taken a lot of damage, I better rest and camp. Additionally, other things that I like is the save system. At least, I should say, ideally. And I'll get into this in the criticism section, but the save system in the ideal is that you only save when um, you rest at a tavern, when you manually save the game, or at certain very, ostensibly very sparse autosave locations. So uh, if you make a big decision, the game will autosave. If uh, you enter a new, uh, new area you've never been into before, like a new uh, country or whatever, autosave. But uh, actually the truth is that the autosaves are a lot more common. And I don't know if this was a last minute change or what, but in my experience, the autosaves happen all the time and actually you don't actually lose any progress. Now in Dragon's Dogma 1, you lost a lot of progress. The game only autosaved, um, the game only saved when you saved it yourself, when you rested at a tavern, or when uh, you entered uh, like a like certain very key locations, so like a safe location. If you entered into a camp, uh, like an encampment or a small city, then you would get an auto save, but not not guaranteed. So, uh, unfortunately, in Dragon's Dogma Two, it seems like somewhere along the process they decided to be pretty generous with auto saves. And to me, I found that there was never a situation where I lost any progress except for one time, which was a bug. And I'm gonna talk about the bugs in a little bit. And that was infuriating. The progress that I lost as a result of the bug was very, very infuriating. But it was not like a designed or intentional progress loss. It was very stupid. Um, extremely annoying. Um, yeah. So, two more things that I like about the game. The variable stamina system. Uh, in this game, you have a stamina bar for all of your actions. Everything that you do takes stamina. And the stamina bar uh, depletes faster if you are have a lot of stuff in your backpack, but also if you're carrying things in your arms, um, if you are sprinting, and... This is where it gets really cool. If you are running uphill, it will deplete faster. And if you are running downhill, it will deplete slower. So in the ideal, you can chart paths towards certain locations that avoid going uphill and instead let you head downhill so that you're expending less stamina and also running faster so you can sprint and get to locations faster. That's really cool. Now, unfortunately, I have a, another critique that's tied to this, which is that I don't think they use the variable stamina system 
to their fullest almost at all throughout the entire game. But it is really cool in the in the abstract. The idea that like you're that there are like system reasons. It almost reminds me a tiny bit, and I say a tiny bit, of Death Stranding, where Death Stranding has a ton of thought that you have to put into the traversal, where every surface affects you differently and will tire your character out and will change how you're approaching the world. It's a small drop of Death Stranding um, that is really cool, and I love that. It, me it means you're putting a lot of thought, or at least you would be putting a lot of thought, into your traversal of the world, which seems like that was something that was very important to the devs. Unfortunately, and we're going to talk about this in just a second, I don't think they fully succeeded. One more thing that I like before we move on to the critique segment. Uh, the enemies that do exist in the game are, especially for the first, I'd say, 40% of your playthrough, are really, really fun to fight. Um, the, the iconic example is the Cyclops. So the Cyclops is what they showed off in basically every single trailer of the game. Um, but basically all of the enemies that are in the game have variable damage, weaknesses, and effects based on where you're attacking them. It almost reminds me a little bit of Monster Hunter, a tiny, tiny bit, in the sense that different body parts have different weaknesses. For an example, on your when you're fighting a Cyclops, its eye, which is a really tiny, really, really tiny vulnerable point, is really weak. If you hit it in the eye, it will be blinded temporarily, potentially permanently, depending on how hard you hit it. And it will start attacking indiscriminately. It won't be able to target anybody. It might even just be attacking off into the distance where nobody is standing because it's blinded. It will also take a crazy amount of damage, but you can break off horns, claws. There's all kinds of parts that you can break off. When you're fighting a griffin, you can set a griffin's wings on fire and that griffin will come to the ground. Awesome. Really cool. Feels super, super fun. Um, there's a lot of love put into the encounters, like into, um, I should say, into the first encounters with most monsters. Um, usually the first time that you encounter a new monster is going to be really cool. Uh, you're going to just be like, wow, what, what? Like one of the first uh, Cyclopses that I ever encountered in the game burst out of a wall. It crashed through a cave in the mountain and it literally just burst through the wall and rocks went flying everywhere. Rocks which are physics objects and could do damage and can be thrown back at the guy. Uh, the, the first time you encounter a griffin swooping in and destroying everything in your path, really, really cool. Those enemies that do exist especially the first time that you encounter them, are really fun and exciting. And that is where I have to stop the positivity. Um, a lot of this review so far, as you can tell, has been very positive. And I structured that like that for a reason. I wanted you guys to understand very viscerally why I want to talk about this game and why I spent so much time in the game. Because there's a lot of stuff to really, really, really like. Um, but unfortunately, there's also a lot of problems with this game. And that's the section we're going to go into now, which is the stuff that I hate, stuff that I dislike, and worst of all, the things that I believe are completely and, and utterly broken. Um, so, Dragon's Dogma is a huge game. Okay, there's a lot in it. It's like, um, it's, a, it's, it's a pretty big game. When you look at the game map, it's almost overwhelming at first. Now, as you actually play the game, uh, they kind of cheat a little bit. The game map is not even close to as big as it seems when you first get in. There are a lot of areas in the map that are simply uh, inaccessible but appear that they might be accessible. It seems, a, it feels a little bit deceptive. Um, there's, but it's still a very large game and there's a lot in it. So keep that all in mind when I'm talking about almost everything here, okay? So let's start. This is probably 
the biggest problem. I shouldn't say that, but it's a big problem, okay? Um, the enemy variety in Dragon's Dogma 2 is inexcusable. Um, it is bad, okay? It's truly, truly bad. And in my opinion, uh, is going to make a lot of players not like this game. And that's a huge shame because the monsters that do exist are really cool. Um, and Dragon's Dogma 1 had more monsters, more monster variety. A game that came out over a decade ago had more monsters and more monster variety in the base game than this game does in a world that is much bigger with much more variety in it except for all the enemies. Um, it's a, a, a serious weak spot um, for this game. The fact that uh, when I when I first jumped into the game and I saw like that there was like a there was like a list of badges for fighting enemies. I'm like, surely there's secret badges that they're not revealing because they don't want you to show it. But no, there is somewhere in the ballpark of 20 or so total enemies, maybe a little more. I don't know the exact list. I don't know the exact count. I would ballpark it somewhere in the ballpark of about 20 enemies in the entire game. And um, that's not going to cut it in a game like this. Uh, the enemy variety is worse than basically any other game that this game like seeks to compare itself to. And one of the biggest problems is not just the variety, but the the way that the encounters go. So um, the, the devs of this game, um, and I'm going to read a quote real quick for you because I feel like this quote is incredibly important to keep in mind. One of the most like publicized quotes at the very beginning of the game was from the uh, game, the director of the game, Itsuno. Um, and I'm going to read you this quote real quick. This was from the IGN article uh, uh, interviewing uh, Itsuno. Okay, are you ready? Just give it a try. Travel is boring? That's not true. That's only an issue because your game is boring. All you have to do is make travel fun. In this particular instance, he was, talk he was asked about why he opposes fast travel. And we're going to talk about that in full in a second. So this is about travel. You know, it's only an issue because your game is boring. All you have to do is make travel fun. That's why you place things in the right location for players to discover or come up with enemy appearance methods that create different experiences each time or force players into blind situations where they don't know whether or, safe, whether or not it's safe 10 meters in front of them. That's a quote directly from, from the director of the game, okay? And uh, uh, I think it is a shocking show of arrogance to call other games boring when the enemy variety is so low, so unbelievably low. In this game, you will do a lot of walking between locations. And for the first maybe 20% to 30% of the game, it's gonna be it's gonna feel pretty fresh okay uh it's it's like wow cool i'm going to these different locations but as the game goes on you are going to get incredibly incredibly tired of walking between uh basically paths through the forest or uh or or like paths through mountain valleys that are full of a patch of wolves, a patch of goblins, a patch of harpies, a patch of wolves, a patch of goblins, a patch of harpies, a patch of wolves. Oh, an ogre. Wolves, goblin, harpy. Oh, oh, more, more goblins. Goblins, harpy, goblins, harpy, wolf. You're going to get so tired of encountering those guys. And while, yes, the enemy variety does slowly crawl up as the game goes through, um, you reach a point where uh, once you've seen every enemy type, getting 
spo spontaneously attacked by an enemy that you've already fought before with no real combination with other enemies um, is it it's not entertaining anymore. Now there are times where you will encounter like wolves and goblins or goblins and harpies, but you almost never, almost never in a hundred hours of play have I encountered, you know, uh, 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 a bunch of goblins fighting a dragon or a bunch of goblins getting attacked by wolves and then an ogre comes in and's trying to eat the wolves and knocking the goblins all over the place. It's incredibly rare. There were probably two or three entire times in the game when I can think of like, uh, where there was a real like monster mishmash situation. And most of them were like scripted, not scripted events, but they were pre-planned events. There's like one area on the map where you can fight two Cyclopses at the same time. There's one area where you're most likely to get attacked by a griffin, and the griffin might land on you while you're fighting some goblins. Total missed opportunity. This game would have been so much better if, first of all, they added more types of monsters for you encounter in the first place. But secondly, if the game was actually able to to figure out how to spawn varieties of monsters in an interesting way. And this gets worse when we get to some of the other stuff I'm about to talk about. Um, like, for example, I'll, I'll actually bring this in right now because I think it, it's a good segue. Um, combat balance. The combat balance in this game is deeply deeply flawed, okay? Um, when you reach a certain point in the game, I would say somewhere in the ballpark of like the 50% point of the game, um, combat stops feeling like anything at all. In the early game, you feel like you're having these big struggling back and forths where enemies take a lot of hits and you can take a lot of hits and you're trying bunches of different abilities and it takes you a bit to get through some of these enemies, but you reach a certain point in the game and like this is without like farming or anything like that. I just played the game and followed my impulses. And it got to a point where um, small enemies like goblins and wolves would just be deleted immediately. You could just instantly delete them. So they're not a threat anymore, really at all. And they don't last in a fight. So it's not like you're having like a big interesting battle with two rival gangs of, of goblins fighting each other and you're in the middle and it's like this whole back and forth thing. No, you just delete all the goblins and it's over. Um, it becomes like very, very quickly. Um, does this happen? But there's another problem of it, which is that um, as the game goes on, the numbers are so imbalanced that hard fights are uh enemies one shot you and you uh rapidly melt enemies and what this creates is a very swingy feel to the combat that in my opinion feels terrible like just horrible so let me give you an example of how an end game fight might go um you're walking down the road there's a dragon you see the dragon you walk up to the dragon you shoot the dragon with your biggest, strongest attack. The dragon gets mad. Maybe you do a big chunk of its health bar. It turns over to you. The dragon flies up into the air and does a, a stomp attack on you. Now, uh, it's kind of hard to read a lot of the abilities, so you might have thought that the breath attack was coming. Uh, either way, it doesn't really matter. If you got hit by either the breath attack or the stomp attack, your whole health bar is gone unless you're playing as a very specific class. But as most classes, your health bar is gone, which means you immediately press the pause menu button and you eat a bunch of um, fish, or you eat a potion, or you eat a bunch of um, what are called roborants. They're little healing items. Help, just munch it up, unpause. Your health's back to full again. Oh, maybe the dragon does a second attack and deletes your entire health bar again. It's okay, open up your pause menu, eat another poison and you're back, or eat another potion and you're back to full health again. That's that becomes the combat after you reach about the 50% point of the game. So half of the game is you either instantly deleting completely stupid enemies that don't do anything to you and pose no threat whatsoever, just boom, 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 gone, gone, gone. Or it's you fighting an enemy that has a huge health bar and does all of your health in one hit, but then you recover your health instantly anyway, so it doesn't really matter. Um, the only time that you will ever use... Um, like an item called a wake stone 
which are like an extra life, of which there are tons of these in the game, by the way. I'm going to go all in on the whole difficulty here as we go on. You can already hear me complaining about it. You get a lot of wake stones in the game. They're extra lives. The only time you're ever going to use one uh, is when you're not fast enough at pressing the start menu to eat a bunch of fish or, or apples or potions. Um, very silly. T feels terrible, especially with the fact that the abilities in the game feel great. They put all this love into these cool abilities, into the weighty combat. The bow feels great to shoot. I loved playing bow. The big double-handed swords and hammers feel great. Doesn't matter. Um, you're just going to be doing this back and forth of if you get hit at all, uh, you're going to just eat a bunch of healing items and it won't matter. And then maybe if you're not fast enough, you have to use a wake stone. Or if you've gotten hit enough, your HP might be so low that you die instantly and then you need to use a wake stone. Um, I think in 100 hours of play, I used about like 18 wake stones. And that includes wake stones that I used on other players because like or on other characters. Because uh, if an NPC dies in your game, you have to use you can use a wake stone to bring them back to life because NPCs have permadeath in this game and that can mess things up. Um, with quests and whatever. Pretty silly. Uh, hits uh, basically become meaningless um, and it starts to feel like an interruption to the flow of the game when you're just pressing pause, eating healing items, unpausing, trying to get out of... There's, did I mention there's no dodge in this game? There's no dodging. There's no parrying. Actually, sorry. There is parrying, but only as a specific class. So only fighters and, um, and, and warrior, or sorry, yeah, only fighters and warriors can have any type of block parry mechanic, and it's fairly limited. Um, all other classes, no dodge, no parry. You just have to sort of goofily walk out of the way. Um, and on this front, I have to be very mean here. I hate usually doing this, but I'm going to do it here. On this front, it starts to feel like Monster Hunter, but bad, which is a terrible place to be in. In Monster Hunter, um, one of the big things in that game is that monsters hit really hard and um, they have like a lot of movement that you have to read. Your dodges have very few iframes, if any, depending on your build in Monster Hunter. You do have a dodge, but you have to spend a lot of time predicting enemy, enemy motion. But that's not really the case here. The enemies move, the the design is not given to like being able to predict enemy mo mo motion very well. You don't have any dodge at all. You just kind of have to walk or move out of the way. And there's a big focus on enemies that do hit combos, which is really dumb. If you get a dragon that does a three hit strike on you, entire health bar gone, pause, eat. Boom, entire health bar gone, pause, eat, unpause. Boom! Entire health bar gone. Pause. Eat. Unpause. Combo done. Terrible. You don't have any means to break out of a combo, really, at all, as most classes. Um, just not good. It's crazy how the first third, the first few hours of the game can feel so good, and the later can feel so bad. And also, the damage scaling which is, this is a part of the combat balance that I'm talking about, gets to the point where most enemies are really not a threat at all. When I got to the last boss of the game, or no, I shouldn't say the last, okay, yeah, the hardest enemy in the game. Uh, I, when I got to the hardest single enemy in the game, uh, it took me, I don't know, maybe eight minutes total to beat him, and it was nothing. It was easy. And I was not like super over leveled or anything to my knowledge. I was just playing the game as it felt to me. Um, yeah, it it sucked. And it was very disappointing. And I, I was really, really frustrated with that aspect. And I think that it's a huge shame because uh, like I said, for the first third of the game, it feels incredible. And if they just, all they really needed to do was take a slightly different approach, tune the numbers slightly different, but it's it as it stands, it's just terrible. Um, I don't know why, uh, because again, uh, for the first third of the game, it's like wow, okay, this feels like uh, it feels like um, 
slightly casual Monster Hunter type combat. It's not as hardcore as Monster Hunter, but the game isn't supposed to be as hardcore, you know? It just feels like you're playing like a like a little more casual Monster Hunter. You get to climb all over the enemies and the battles take a while. In Dragon's Dogma 1, that game had fairly long combat encounters, which was great in a lot of ways. Some people don't like that style because they feel bad about, you know, having to slowly chip an enemy down, but it felt good in my opinion. When I played Dragon's Dogma 1, I loved the fact that monster fights took a long time and that they usually didn't kill you in one hit, that they were kind of these long battles of attrition. And I think that was great. Not so in Dragon's Dogma 2. They feel very bad as the game goes on. Um, yeah, it's un very unfortunate. Uh, and that should be a word of warning. Now, keep in mind, I did keep playing the game, and there was still stuff that I was having fun with all the way until the end of the game, but at every, at the further, the longer you play the game, the more the combat starts to feel bad. And there's another problem that ties into this, okay? Which is that uh, in Dragon's Dogma 2, they made a very weird decision, and that is that they lowered the ability slots from six in Dragon's Dogma 1 to four in Dragon's Dogma 2. You have your face buttons, okay? Now they added in some, some other things. There's like some passive abilities, but they're pretty minuscule in most cases. The passive abilities are not all that impactful in my opinion. I mean, sometimes they are, but they're not like, they don't feel like you're spending a lot of time thinking about them. And some of them are really like, just like, uh, well, obviously. Like, for example, the passive ability for archers is that you can aim. Obviously. W what? Come on. Um, but the fact that there's only four slots is terrible, okay? It's really bad. And it gets really bad. Um, we're going to talk about the Warfarer. But, and we're going to talk about mages in just a second, they suffer the most from this. But the four slots means that you either have to choose to intentionally have a bad build that is often not fun, or you choose the obvious choices for your four abilities. There are a lot of abilities in this game, and I am not kidding you, you will barely see any of them see play, okay? The abilities that we'll see play are are very obvious they're really easy to pick which ones are the best um they become apparent incredibly quickly and you'll even see them on the pawns there's a ton of abilities that nobody puts on their pawns and nobody puts on their character bar because they are way too niche some of them are even really cool there are some really amazing abilities that are like, oh, this would be great, but it's too niche. If I take this, I'm going to have a dead skill slot in battle, and I don't want a dead skill slot in battle. I only have four abilities. I want to be able to actually play in battle and do things. And uh, it's per it gets pretty bad on that front. Four uh, ability slots, this game was not designed for four ab ability slots. It, it truly was not. Um... And this becomes especially apparent with the Warfarer vocation, vocation okay? Uh, the Warfarer is a massive cop-out, okay? It is unbelievably bad. I can't even believe that this game shipped with a vocation that they were hyping up in the, in the trailers, that they were hyping up in the marketing materials that is so embarrassing. Let me explain the Warfarer. The Warfarer is the last class that you will unlock in the game in all likelihood. Um, it is a, a secret vocation that was touted as being able to take and pull from every single vocation in the game. And what they mean by that is uh, nothing, actually. The, way f the Warfarer is a joke. And here's what I mean. The Warfarer can take passive abilities and primary abilities with the exception of the ultimate final ability of each class it could use any of them it can use any ability besides the ultimate ability and any passive ability just like as if you were playing as that class and it only has three abilities of its own it has two passives whereas most classes have uh, anywhere from five to eight i think 
passive abilities that you unlock. It has only two, which are amazing, and you're going to take them on basically every single build that you do. And it unlocks an ability called... Uh, I can't remember what it's called. It, it's, it's an ability that lets you switch weapons, okay? So um, I want you to, to, you go, oh, wow, cool. So you can switch between the weapons between each class, right? You can, but the problem is, is that that ability takes up a skill slot. And you, when you switch weapons, you don't switch your skill slots. You you have to pick static skill slots that can only work when you're using that weapon. So to play Warfarer as the Warfarer, you have to have a dead slot to switch weapons and slots that are dead when you're not using that weapon. It, the maximum number of weapons you can have equipped as Warfarer is three, okay? So what that would mean is, is that you're, you're, you have one button for each weapon that you can use. Just terrible and this is where it gets really funny which is that the warfarer levels up all classes which means the real way to play the game is to unlock warfarer and then play exact just equip one weapon never use the weapon swap ability at all and just equip whatever you want from that class and pretend that you're playing that class for the entire last 35% or so of the game, I was just playing Archer, but my class was technically Warfarer because when you're playing as Warfarer, you level up all other classes. And the only thing that I was missing out on is the ultimate ability, which was terrible anyway. So why wouldn't I do that? Why wouldn't I play as Warfarer and get the Warfarer benefits plus all of the Archer abilities that I liked and level up all my other classes so I can have fun with those abilities if I want to. Total cop-out. Now, I have a suggestion. I don't want to be completely negative, but I have a suggestion. And I think Dragon's Dogma, because I know you guys are listening. Capcom, I know you listen to the Demon Mama stream, right? By the way, if you're Capcom, or anybody else for that matter, you should be subscribed to my channel. I talk about all kinds of stuff, lots of video game stuff. I go deep, deep, deep into video games that I love. And you should be subscribed to Demon Mama. So press subscribe down below. And also, this is the little opportunity. If you've watched this far, if you've watched this far into the video, I'm going to borrow from my boy Mug Thief. Shout out to Mug Thief. Great channel, by the way. But I'm going to borrow from him. If you have watched this far in the video, leave a comment below that says Beloved. And you'll know that I'll see it. I'll heart every single comment that I get that says Beloved. Okay? There you go. If you watch this far, you got the secret word. Do it. All right, let's continue. With, uh, with, with all my love, I'm going to give a suggestion to Capcom, who I know watches my videos, obviously. Um, Warfarer should not be a vocation. You should just become the Warfarer at a certain point in the game. I recommend a big quest. You go and you do a big epic quest. Think like a quest like uh, like the Ronnie quest line in Elden Ring. A big, long, story-filled quest. And at the end of it, you become the Warfarer, which simply unlocks all of the other classes and lets you level them all at the same time. You got to go do a big quest. It gives it some significance. And then you just unlock everything. Instead of instead of having a dead, a, a class that is that is meaningless on a design level. There is no reason to not play Warfarer except for a handful of ultimate abilities, most, most of which are not very good. Um, for most classes, you're just going to play Warfarer and pretend that you're playing as another class. And also, I forgot to mention this, but Warfarer can wear any armor from any class, which means that the class that lets you play with style is Warfarer. So why don't you just become the Warfarer at some point? Why would you make it so that the obvious answer is to choose the class that lets you dress in anything and use any abilities, but also has kind of like stupid and pointless side things and is its own vocation? Just makes no sense. Just have a quest where the Arisen rises and awakens and you wake up and you're like, ah, I am the Warfarer now. I can access all of these abilities in my true awakened form. 
there you go. You can have that. You can have that idea for free, Capcom. It will make your game better. Okay, especially because most people are going to play as the Warfarer just for the fashion option anyway. So just let the Arisen turn into the Warfarer. There's no reason not to. And let us use the ultimates on the Warfarer at that point. There's no reason to limit them. The most of the ultimates, like I said, are not that good. They're mostly niche and kind of funny. Um, I don't want to talk. I don't want to spoil all of the all of the ultimate abilities. But let me tell you, uh, most of the ultimate abilities are goofy and or very niche, with one exception, which is sorcerer. And sorcerer has the most broken ultimate ability in the entire game, which you will inevitably put onto a pawn, because if you have a pawn with the sorcerer ultimate, you will delete every enemy in the game with almost no challenge whatsoever. The ultimate spells for sorcerer are so incredibly good and they're so slow to cast that just putting them on a pawn is the obvious answer. Kind of sucks. Anyway. Let's continue. Let's, let's continue, okay? Okay. Warfarer, total cop-out, combat balance and enemy variety is really, really borked. But unfortunately, that is not the end of my critiques. I have, unfortunately, quite a few critiques. And the next critique I'm going to do is another vocation critique, the Trickster. The Trickster was another one of the classes that was very, very showed off. Like it was, it was heavily advertised in a lot of the in a lot of the marketing material building up to the game. The Trickster is uh, ostensibly an illusionist. You use a a smoke, you know what's it called? Um, uh, it's called a um, thurible. It's a little like thing on chains. It's a it's got incense in it, and and smoke comes out of it. And you use this smoke to 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 enchant and trick enemies. At least that's what you're supposed to be able to do. The Trickster is a very strange class. In game, the Trickster does not do any damage. And I mean that you do so little damage that it's, it is about as close to zero as possible. When you hit an enemy with your Thurible, they take a, like I'm talking single digits damage even at the end of the game. You will not see it register on a health bar. You could technically finish off an enemy, but you are not gonna be doing damage. And none of their spells do any damage. Everything that they do is built around uh, supposedly being able to manipulate the battlefield. And some of that sounds on, on in concept very cool, right? Um, however, in execution, it is atrocious and essentially unplayable um, in any serious way. It is a goof class that you play uh, to challenge yourself if you want to have like if you're like if you've got like a masochistic streak. And I mean that it's like a, it's 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 very, very difficult to play. And one of the reasons why it's so difficult to play is because of the combat balance, which I talked about before. OK, the combat balance. Th this class, so let me explain, I should explain exactly how it works. To play this class, you can summon an illusory version of yourself. So you can summon up this little, little phantom of yourself. And that phantom taunts enemies that have been hit by your smoke. So you need to hit enemies with your smoke, and then you need to summon or have summoned already your little illusion. And your illusion and, your, and you also taunt when they're affected by your smoke because your illusion and yourself are indistinguishable to the enemies. Your illusion can be damaged and dispelled and there is a cast time to summon it back. Additionally, if you personally take damage, you will lose your illusion. So you not only need to keep your smoke touching enemies so that they can be taunted, but your illusion will disappear if you take damage or if it takes damage. And what you can do with your illusion is you can put it on an enemy and that enemy will become the target of nearby enemies that have been affected by your smoke, which sounds kind of cool. You're like, oh, okay, so if there's a bunch of goblins, I can hit them all with smoke and I can put my illusion 
onto a dragon and all the goblins will attack the dragon. Except I already mentioned goblins die in one hit from basically fucking everything at the end of the game. And the dragons especially will delete the goblins instantly. And the, the dragon will delete your illusion immediately, which means they won't be taunted to the dragon. And making goblins attack each other is pointless because your, your pawns will delete them immediately. And on top of that, it's really, really hard to get your illusion to actually stick to an enemy. And if you take any damage during any of that, your illusion will disappear. Now, they have some other abilities. One of the ones that was showed off in the trailer is the trick platform. You can make a, a piece of ground that appears to be real uh, uh, appear, and you can put your illusion out on it, and maybe an enemy might go and try and walk on it and fall off. But the chance of you actually being able to execute that is very low. Uh, very, very low. And it really only looks good uh, for a funny gimmick. You can't actually play this class. The class is just unplayable in the game if you want to actually play the game. If you want to goof around and do some challenge runs, you might be able to have some fun with it, but the reality is, no. And it really sucks because the Trickster has an incredible amount of cool armor. The one that I showed you, this image that I showed you that I was was absolutely obsessed with, the one where I had the smoke thurible in front of the fire, this one. Uh, this, this, this outfit right here, this is a Trickster outfit. You can see I got the thurible and the whole cool outfit with the embroidered sleeves. And they've got a lot of really cool ones, okay? But playing that class is very, very difficult. And another thing that tells me that they didn't they didn't do they didn't pay attention while they were doing this um, is the fact that they only have six weapons. Every other class has tons of weapons. Trickster, six. Six weapon upgrades through the entire game. Every other class has way more. Like shockingly more. So it sounds to me like they uh, they were phoning it in for their trickster class. Um, and this leads me to a spot. We're going to take a small moment away from my critiques, and we're going to veer into the world of... My sources that I made it the fuck up. We're at, that's right. We're going into the world of conspiracy, okay? We're going into the world of conspiracy, all right? In Dragon's Dogma 1, throwables were extremely plentiful in the game. Now, they sucked, okay? In Dragon's Dogma 1, you could not really aim your throwables. You had to equip a throwable from your start menu, uh, point your character in vaguely the correct direction, and then you would throw it at a static length. And you'd hope it would hit. But there was a ton of them. Okay, in Dragon's Dogma 1, they had rotten fruit throwing pies. You could throw little jester pies. They had uh, poison bombs, throwing knives, throwing javelins, rocks. Uh, little. You could throw cups at people. You could throw little bouncy balls at people. There was an unbelievable amount of throwing items in Dragon's Dogma 1 and no throwing system. In Dragon's Dogma 2, they added a throwing system. When you pick up enemies or you pick up rocks or boxes in the environment using the grab key, you have an aiming system by which you can actually throw them, which means throwing rocks and throwing enemies and throwing boxes is pretty fun, at least for the first third of the game. But guess what? There's no throwables. Except something really strange. The pawns reference throwable items. There are items you can pick up in the game and the pawns will go, Arisen, this would make an incredible projectile to throw at our opponents. Which makes me think that throwable items are cut content. And of course, My source is that I made it the fuck up. But I genuinely, I actually do believe that. And, and I want to tell you another piece of, of theory as to why I believe in this conspiracy theory. Not only do the pawns reference it, not only is there basically no use for rotten fruit in the game. You get rotten meat, rotten fruit, but you can't throw them. They just sit in your inventory, and if you're lucky, you might be able to mix it with something to turn it into um, oil. Sometimes. Most of the time, not. 
However, the trickster, the trickster class is so bad. And yet everything in the trickster class says this is the perfect class to use throwables. Imagine that even in its current bungled form, the trickster would make so much more sense if there was throwables. Oh, you put your little smoke illusion out and the enemies are coming to look at it and you're standing up above throwing rotten fruit at them or poison bombs or grenades. The, oh, the goblins have throwing items. The goblins throw rocks and the gob little pebbles, not big rocks that you pick up in the environment. They throw pebbles and they throw oil flasks and they throw bombs at you. So the goblins have the throwables, but the player character does not. And the trickster class seems like it's just missing something that just so happens to be throwables. That's my theory. That's my, that's my sinister theory, my, my conspiracy theory, okay? Incredible, right? <sighs> okay, so enough about my conspiracy theory. Wayfarer is a joke. Trickster is a joke. There's no throwables in the game. The enemy variety sucks. The combat balance is all off. And there are a few more things we have to talk about before I'm done, okay? I told you this was gonna be exhaustive. Guys, the quest design. We gotta talk about the quest design. Um, the quest design in this game made me cry. <laughs> The quest design in this game, I have not seen a game with such embarrassingly bad quest design. Um, I don't know, uh, in a long time, okay? This was some PlayStation 2 ass quest design. The quest design is one of two things. Uh, it is either the most obvious hand-holdy toddler garbage that you've ever encountered in your entire life or nonsensical to the point of laughability, okay? It is quite ridiculous. Um, the, 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 the quests are, almost all of the quests in the game are some variety of, of a fetch quest or a, a point A to point B. You go, go talk to this person here, then go talk to that person there, then go talk to this person here, and you're done on the quest. There is, There are a series of stealth quests in the beginning to middle of the game. They are not actually stealth quests, okay? I'm, I'm not kidding you. They, they are framed in game as stealth quests, but there is no stealth in the game. There's no stealth. Uh, you just, there's a part where you're supposed to sneak in to the castle. And what they mean is you just walk in the door of the castle and walk up to the room uh, that you're supposed to go in. And as long as, as long as you do it, when one NPC is down the, on the other end of the hall, all of the guards, all of the other characters ignore you. There is one NPC that just needs to be on a scripted basis. He will scriptedly walk down the hall. You walk into his room and grab his thing. That's it. And there are multiple stealth quests like this in the game. They're not stealth quests at all. They have a simple precursor that you must do and a scripted event that you just have to wait around the corner for. There's another stealth quest where you're supposed to sneak into a secret underground like lab in the bottom of a church. And literally all you have to do is stand a certain distance away from the like nun who's guarding the door. You, she, you can be within sight of her. I literally stood outside the door just like this. And my, and she was just like, well, thank goodness no one's here. Better go back to my nunly duties. Walked right past me and away. And I just walked in the door behind her. I was literally just standing in a doorway like this on the edge of the, the distance range that you're supposed to be. It is embarrassing, okay? I don't even know why they bothered Okay, but that's not even like what I'm talking about when I'm that's that is that is just lazy not putting a stealth system in your game and for some reason insisting that there's there needs to be stealth quests. What I'm really talking about when I'm talking about quest design is the fact that like 
there's no creativity dumped into there's no creativity put into any of these quests. Every single quest is um is a fairly rote go from talk to guy here, go to this place, talk to guy there, go to this place or go kill this thing or go get me this item and bring it back. That's all of the quests in the entire game with one exception, which is the Sphinx stuff. The Sphinx quest line has some creativity. They are still mostly fetch quests, but they are kind of creative fetch quests. Like, um, I don't want to spoil all the Sphinx stuff, but I'll give, I'll, I'll, I'll spoil one of the Sphinx ones. One of the Sphinx riddles makes you go and find the first item of a certain type that you picked up in the game, which is very funny. It's still a fetch quest, but it's really funny to make you try and remember where you picked up the first item of a certain type in the game. That's that's kind of funny. The Sphinx, though, is about it. Other than that, all of the quests follow an incredibly rote pattern. And, and there are a few quests that are complicated. Um, and by complicated, I mean they have multiple steps. There are a number of quests in the game that have multiple steps. And those steps are usually multiple branching paths with, with, with the actual tasks being little fetch quests. But they are like branching paths, and this is a and this is not praise, okay? Because um, the way that this game tries to communicate to you what you're supposed to do on a quest um, is not good, and it's especially not good when it mixes with bugs. All of the quests in this game, even the complicated ones, have a very um, stilted and awkward progression. And what I mean by that is basically a guy will talk to you and go, we need to go do this. And then you'll press A and they'll immediately go back to their, their usual activities. Um, outside of like initiating a quest, characters basically do not tell you anything. They have a set, they have like a set pool of lines and even if you are in the middle of the most intense thing ever they'll just be like fine weather we're having today mud crabs nasty little things it's it's more oblivion than oblivion and as a result like it's like quest on anyway arisen it's time for us to go do this thing quest off nice weather we're having today and that makes the quests feel really weird but on top of that a lot of quests just kind of lazily teleport you around I'm going to tell a story because I feel I was having a hard time putting into words exactly how to describe the juddering pacing of every single quest in the game where the quest goes from like locked screen talking to a guy, go to a place, locked screen talking to a guy, uh, walk into an area, cutscene happens. They're very, very chunky. But I'm going to I'm going to tell you a quick story. I typed this all out because I wanted to when this happened, I knew I had to talk about it, okay? So let me, it's not old school. Old school games had really had quests that might have been slightly technically chunky, but that nonetheless had flow with the rest of the game. You know, uh, I, I don't know. I've played a lot of games over the years, a lot of RPGs, and some of them have, you know, if you talk to somebody, they'll usually talk to you about the quest, but this game doesn't really have a dialogue system. It has like half a dialogue system, it's very chunky. Well, let me tell you this story, okay? And this is going to have spoilers for one of the end game quests in it. I promise you, you're not missing anything when I tell you this. But I'll, just as a warning, just in case, minor spoilers for one of the end game quests. Listen to this story, okay? Okay, so when you get to the end game, there's a big event that happens and the world the, the world state changes towards the end of the game and a bunch of stuff has to happen. And one of the things that you're supposed to do is you're supposed to do these evacuation quests. So at the end of the game, this character appears and says, go evacuate the people from all of the major cities. They're in danger. You need to go to all of the major cities and evacuate them, go quickly. And so I'm like, oh, um, okay. Um, I gotta go there. So I was like, um, well, all right. I just, I, I'm nearest to the, there's this big mining pit zone. 
and it's right near where you fight the final boss. And I'm like, okay, well, I wanted to go check the location where I fought the final boss because I had a suspicion, I don't know, maybe there'd be a special item, maybe there'd be some clues or something. And there's also a place that I would want to evacuate near that. So I go to that location um, and I'm, I'm walking in and as I, as I walk into the area, uh, the, the, the camera gets taken from me and a guard runs up to me and the guard goes, uh, the guard's like, things have gotten very bad here. I, I, we need to evacuate everyone, but I'm not sure that I can do it on my own. And I'm like, okay. So I end the dialogue and immediately he, he disappears and a golem spawns in and he's fighting the golem and he's like, help Risen, help. And so I'm like, what? And so I go run over and I insta kill the golem. It's like, it's like dead in, in seconds. Okay. And then he's like, and then immediately, the second the golem dies, I'm stuck back. I'm like teleported back into dialogue with this guard. And he's like, well done, Arisen. Now that you helped me defeat the threat, I'll be able to evacuate all of the people here. You have saved us truly. And I was like, okay. And then I exited the dialogue and he starts walking away and everyone in the town despawns except for one merchant. I'm like, oh, okay, so I guess I evacuated this area. And I was like, okay. And then I decided to explore around and make sure I didn't miss anything. And I found that actually there was one merchant and there were four guys in jail. And I talked to them in jail and they just had generic lines. And so I'm like, okay, I'm guessing that's a bug. Okay. So I'm like, all right, I'm going to go, I'm going to go continue and go check some other locations. So uh, I go to another location for another quest that they give you at the end of the game. And when I go there, they're like, the person who gave you the evacuate, who tells you to go evacuate everybody's like, thank goodness that you came here. This is the location that you need to evacuate everyone to. And I'm like, oh, okay. I thought that I was just supposed to go evacuate them, but now you're telling me, oh, I got to evacuate them here. And I was like, um, okay. So you unlock a new city on the map that you can send people to. And I was like, all right. And then I got a new quest in my quest menu that started tracking people that I could evacuate. But the mining pit people weren't on there. So I was like, maybe they don't count. Maybe they're just like too small to go on the quest checklist. So I went and I started evacuating some other um places. I'm like, right. Okay. Like she told me to go evacuate people. I now know where to evacuate them. So I'm going to go and I'm going to go to the main big city, this town called Vernworth. Okay. A lot of the quests happen in this place. And I'm like, okay, uh, in Vernworth, you got, uh, you got a bunch of different characters that you meet in Vernworth. And one of them is like this little prince. Okay. He's like, he's a prince. Okay. And part of the main story is that you help this prince, uh, basically take control of the town. At, from a bad lady, okay? So I'm like, okay, well, I got to go talk to the prince, right? The prince is my friend. I've, I've done a bunch of quests for the prince and he's the guy who's definitely going to do the evacuation, right? So I go all the way into the castle and I talk to the prince and he's like, e gads, it's the end of the world? I had noticed that it was the end of the world, but I'm happy that you told me it was the end of the world. And then I was like, he's like, however, I need you to talk to my, my, my captain first. Sorry, he just says, my captain, go talk to the guard captain. And so I'm like, okay. So then I go talk to the guard captain and the guard captain goes, it's great to see you arisen. Where have you been? We need to talk to, to, to the prince immediately. I'm like, I was just talking to the prince. So I run all the way back and I talk to the prince. And then the prince is like, thank goodness you came to me. I'm like, I just came to you. You told me to go to the guard. The guard told me to come back to the prince. And then he's like, now go do this fetch quest. You literally have to carry a bag of gold to somebody else. It's so stupid. Then you go back, then everybody evacuates. And that's when I noticed, okay, this city shows up on the evacuation checklist, which made me nervous because I evacuated that other place beforehand. So I went on the internet and I looked up a guide to the quest. And that was when I discovered that something was wrong. Something was very wrong. So on the guide that I looked up online, it was like, yeah, to evacuate the mining pit location, you need to help 
the guard, fight the golem, and then he'll tell you that everyone couldn't evacuate and that he needs a special staff to help everyone evacuate. And I'm like, that didn't happen. So I'm like, well, I better go back. So I walked all the way back to the mining pit, which is on the farthest south location on the map. And, uh, and, I, was, and I fought all the boring enemies on the way there and I got there and it's empty still. Nobody's there, even though I've started this new quest. It's just the my just that one merchant, and the uh, and the the guys and the the people in the jail. I searched top and bottom. I searched this entire place, every corner of this zone. I searched trying to find the guard so that I could properly e e evacuate this town. Don't find him. So I'm like, well, all right then. I guess I must have completed it, and maybe I bugged it. Who knows? Out of out of out of uh, caution, I put down a teleportation sign there. I go back, I finish all of the other evacuation quests, and I get nervous one more time, and I'm like, okay, I put down that teleport sign, let me go back and just make sure I didn't miss this guy. So I go all the way back to this mine location, thankfully this time I have a teleport point, and I search from top to bottom again. And this time, on my way out of the jail, out of nowhere, the guard just teleports. He just appears. I'm not kidding you. Just like out of a wall. He's just like, and he appears and he goes, Arisen, thank goodness. There are pawns trapped in the jail and they won't follow orders. We need the magic staff to tell them to leave. I'm like, what? where the fuck were you? Oh my God. And then I immediately walked over and in the empty town, I found the staff instantaneously and then he evacuated the four pawns that were just sitting there. And that is one of the branching paths, multiple complex quests. It is so difficult to tell if you've bugged or broken a quest. The game does not communicate well. The game does not communicate even at the best of times what you're supposed to be doing unless it's literally telling you directly what you need to do and puts an objective on your map. It is all over the place. Okay, it is really, really frustrating. There are a lot of quests that you can fail and you will often never know if you bugged the quest or if you failed the quest. There's another quest in the game that has multiple branching paths and if you, there is a way to successfully, to succeed fail the quest, where you succeed at the quest and then it gets stuck in your quest log because uh, uh, you can't, you can't, because if you did another quest, you can't do the last step because they didn't give you any alternatives. So the quest just stays in your log for the rest of the game. And you don't know, well, am I supposed to keep looking for this guy to like finish this quest? Or is it bugged? Sometimes it legitimately bugs. Multiple people reported the quest actually just bugging. Just, uh, just what? I'm going to tell you another example of what I mean when I say the quest design is terrible in this game. And this is not buggy. This is by design, okay? This one's a little shorter, all right? There's a quest where an, import, an important character, uh, this is very random. You're walking through town and the captain of the guard walks up to you and goes, there's an assassination attempt against our wonderful and amazing empress. I need your help. And you're like, okay, I'll help you then. I don't know the empress, but sure, I'll help you. Um, and then she's t she tells you this big block of dialogue and she describes what the killer looks like and what happened last time, which is that the, uh, the, the, the empress was praying and the killer tried to get her, okay? And then she says, all right, we got to prevent this. Don't let the killer kill the empress. And the empress starts praying. You can walk and stand right next to the empress. And I'm sitting there going, I've been told what this guy looks like. I've been told, okay, don't let him do any, don't let him approach the empress, don't let him kill the empress. So I'm guarding the empress. Then the guard lady starts yelling at me. She's like, we need to find him, search the crowd. And I'm like, search the crowd? Okay. It's in like a dark room, you can barely see anything. So I go over and I start talking to people in the crowd. Like I'm supposed to find this guy, this sus ass guy. And there's a bunch of characters that like loosely match the description. She's like, quickly, you need to find him. And I'm like, I, and then I'm like, I don't know exactly what I'm supposed to be doing. And then she's like, make sure you don't grab the wrong guy. Cause whoever it is, he'll be tortured for sure. I'm like, okay. 
and then just like, don't let the queen die. And I was like, okay, so I said, I'll just go stand next to the queen. And if this guy tries to make a move for it, I'll try and catch him. I'm standing next to the queen, right? The game goes into a cutscene, fades to black, queen dies. Fades back in, queen's dead body is on the floor. I was teleported away. Apparently what you're supposed to do is you're supposed to find the guy that you suspect and then you're supposed to pick them up. Like just pick them up. Like just heave them over your shoulder. That's all you're supposed to do. You're supposed to go find a guy in the audience and heave them over your shoulder, okay? So the, the Empress dies, right? I walk over to the Empress and I immediately resurrect her using a resurrection stone. No problem, right? Empress dies. I bring her back to life immediately. She starts walking off and the Empress walks off in a random direction. If you talk to the Empress, she doesn't say anything. She just says her normal lines of dialogue. So then I'm like, okay, I guess I'm supposed to go talk to the guard lady. And I talk to the guard lady and the guard lady goes, I am, this is it. It's over for me. I've been exiled forever. Goodbye forever now. Since the queen is dead, since the empress is dead, I've been exiled. Goodbye. And then you end the dialogue and she immediately disappears. The queen, the empress walks into the throne room where the guard was two seconds ago. And then once she's in the throne room, I go, hello. And she goes, Oh no, they've exiled my favorite guard. We need to prepare a letter to, to take to her so that she can come back from exile. And I'm like, okay, give me the letter. She's like, come back to me in a bit and I'll have a letter prepared for you. I'm like, okay. So I walk out the room and one of the people at the front door goes, holy shit, the Empress is alive. You've saved us, Arisen. Thank you for bringing the Empress back to life. And I'm like, oh, okay. Did I guess, then I go back into the room and talk to the Empress. She's like, I need more time to write the letter. So I wait a couple of days, go do other stuff, come back to the Empress. And she says, I need a little more time to give me a letter to my guard, to get me a letter to my favorite guard so you can go deliver it. So I go look online. Turns out she never gives you a letter. You just actually just have to go tell the guard. She, she will never give you a letter. You never get a letter. Even though she tells you to come back and give you a letter, um, you just never get a letter. Letter. You just go talk to the guard, and then she goes, thank goodness, I can leave forever exile now, and then she goes back to town. Just the f what the fuck? And that is not a bugged quest. That is how the quest is designed. There's no bug going on there. She never, there is no letter item that you get. You're just supposed to go talk to her after a certain number of time. And that's a lot of the quests in the game, okay? Oh, I feel like I've, uh, oh my God. I feel like I've, I've been ranting so much, but there's just, there's just, the quests are just so goofy. It's so goofy. All right, there's one last thing I'm gonna talk about. No, there's two last things I'm gonna talk about, okay? The fast travel. In this game, and I and remember, I'm going to read the quote again, okay? On the topic of, of fast travel, the, 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 the director of the game, Itsuno, says, director Itsuno says, just give it a try. Travel is boring. That's not true. It's only an issue because your game is boring. All you have to do is make travel fun. That's why you place things in the right location for players to discover or come up with enemy appearance methods that create different experiences each time or force players into blind situations where they don't know whether it's safe or not 10 meters in front of them. Okay. All of that is a load of crock. Okay. This game has so much fast travel, it's not even funny. And in fact, once you get to the end game portion, you literally find fast travel items laying all over the ground. By the end of the game, I was using tra fast travel items all the time and I had 35 just piled up in my inventory. They, you use so much fast travel in this game, there is quite literally no reason for them to even restrict fast travel at all. At the end, oh my God, it's so silly. The fast travel is so abundant 
that only really for the first like 30% of the game will you need to be picky with your fast travel at all. And in reality, you really don't. I was very nervous to use my fast travel items and, and, and didn't use them because I was worried there was only going to be like 10 fast travel items in the entire game. So for the beginning of the game, I just ran everywhere. And it was fine. I'm totally fine with that. It, it was fun enough at the beginning. But I realized very quickly that I didn't need to worry at all, that you can just fast travel as free as much as you want. Um, and you get so many... Uh, there's these items that you can place that are like... They're, they're fast travel crystals that you put down that you can fast travel to, but you can immediately pick them back up again. They're not permanent. You put them down, pick them up. So go to a location that you want to go, put a fast travel crystal there. You can travel there whenever you want. And then when you're done with it, just pick it up. And there's tons of these in the game. So many that I was literally, I, at the end game, I was just teleporting across the map anytime I needed anything at all. And I didn't even come close to even scratching the surface of the stores of my fast travel. There is so much fast travel in this game. The ox cart system is a form of fast travel. And when they first talked about it in the game, they made it seem like the ox carts were not that fast. That you would go on an ox cart and you would have to sort of, you, you could automatically go to a location, but it might be, you know, not, a, it might be easy, but it might not actually be that much faster. But that's not actually true because you can go to sleep on the ox carts. So you climb on an ox cart, you pay a laughable amount of money. It's like 10 cents equivalent in like, it's nothing. It's just a dime, okay? And then you just press the Y button to go to sleep. And yeah, there's a chance you get attacked by enemies. Um, and the first time that happens, it's kind of funny. You're like, oh my god, I got attacked by enemies. My ox cart got interrupted. And once in a great while, you might actually have your ox cart get destroyed if you get attacked by a big enough enemy. But in reality, what happens is you get so good so quickly that you melt the enemies immediately, climb back onto the ox cart and fall asleep. So what it, rea what it really is, is it's just fast travel with a slight interruption. The first few times that you get your ox cart ambushed, it kind of feels novel. You're like, oh, that's kind of fun. It's cool. And after a while, it just becomes a, boy a boring and easy interruption. There's no real threat. You just are taking your ox cart and an enemy pops up. You have to do a little quick time event, basically. Kill the enemy real quick, climb back on, and continue your fast travel. Um, feels like a bunch of loading screens. Uh, the, 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 the like fast anti-fast travel thing is pure load of crock. I don't know what they were talking about. It's silly. Don't believe anybody who tells you that there's not fast travel in this game. It is overwhelmingly full of tra fast travel. Um, and uh, the last thing. The last and final thing I want to talk about in this game uh, is that n almost every item in the game, with I believe two exceptions, can be found at a vendor. Um, it's that simple. Uh, the, there are almost no dungeon variety. The dungeon types in this game are bad. It's cave, tomb, magma cave, and castle dungeon basement. There is no other, to my, to my recollection, no other types of dungeon that you go into. You get a cave, you get a magma cave, you get a tomb that looks like a cave, and you get a castle dungeon that kind of looks like a tomb. Um, they're very boring, uh, and they sometimes have treasures at the end. However, there is, you can almost always buy that treasure at, at, um, vendors already. And yeah, it's sometimes expensive, but it doesn't really matter that much. And in fact, this is what really hurts. There's even a joke. If you buy an item at a vendor and then you find it in a chest moments later or like fairly, you know, soon afterwards, your pawns will go, doesn't it feel bad to find an exact copy of an item that you just spent a lot of money on, Arisen? There is the pawn lamp shading of bad design decisions made me angry by the end of the game. Just, oh, what? Oh, God damn. Whew. Yeah. So, I think that's everything. I think I've, uh, I think I've touched on every aspect of Dragon's Dogma 2 that I loved, liked, and was very, very angered by. <laughs> Unfortunately, Dragon's Dogma 2 is a 
very flawed game. There is a lot that I love about it. There is a lot of fun to be had in the first 20 to 30 hours of play, which, hey, that's pretty good. But unfortunately, you're not going to feel like you got a complete experience by 20 to 30 hours. You're going to want to play the rest of the game, and the game gets worse and worse the longer that it goes on. There are decisions that they took things away from, from Dragon's Dogma 1. They removed features from Dragon's Dogma 1. It, it's very strange, and I don't know why. Um, and, and most of the things that they were boasting about being like, like shocking and innovative features of this game simply aren't. It's just not true that the fast travel is particularly restricted. It just isn't. The game is super full of fast travel, and it's really easy to do. Um, the healing system is messed up. The, the combat scaling is busted, and there's basically no enemy variety. Some of this stuff, I believe, could be fixed with DLC and a patch, but some of it will never be fixed or is so unlikely to be fixed that there's just no changing it. I don't know how you change the terrible writing and the terrible quest design. The quests are just terrible. And the problem with the quest is that most of them, with the exception of the Meister quests, which give you special abilities, have no reward other than experience and gold. Just feels terrible. Why, I mean, there's some story repercussions sometimes for some of the quests. Most of them don't go anywhere because they don't actually change anything in the world or they change so little that it doesn't actually affect all that much. Like, there's no point at the, you know... Let me give an example of this. In Dragon's Dogma 1, there's a quest line that you can do for a kind of weird guy. You meet this weird guy in the first city of Dragon's Dogma 1, and he asks you to find him a tome. When you go to try and get the tome, you find out that it got stolen by a bunch of bandits, which then leads you to... Um, uh, the bandit fortress and there's multiple ways you can do it you can kill all the bandits immediately and steal their stuff and get the this thing back or you can work for the bandits and go do another quest and then they'll give you the book um there's a bunch of different ways you can do it if you get this book for this guy he gives you a quest reward he gives you money and some experience but also there's a pretty major boss fight shortly after this and if you have done that quest with that guy, he appears to help you during the boss fight. He's like, I decided to become a pilgrim after you gave me that magic book and the pilgrimage sent me here. When I got close to the tower, I heard a horrible noise and I rushed up to the top of the tower and I saw you getting attacked by a monster. So I rushed in to help you straight up. That's awesome. You do a story quest and something changes about the world in a way that you have that you can feel. There's very little of that in this game. Almost none of your quests actually plug back in and affect you in any in any way. There's like sometimes they'll be like, thank you for doing that, but it's not like they plug into another quest later in most of the cases. Which just means that the quest design is very it seems almost unfixable. Uh, and that's unlikely to change, even with DLC. However, things like enemy variety, combat balance, things like that, that might be fixed in the future. Um, some of the classes might be fixed in a future patch. Uh, if throwables get put into the game, Trickster might actually be a fun class. Um, in the end, to summarize everything that I've talked about here, I really, really... I, there was so much that I loved about Dragon's Dogma 2, but it is so deeply flawed of a game that it's very hard for me to recommend it just without any considerations. And I, I hope that that Capcom and, the, and Itsuno and the other people working on this game are able to hear, I'm not the only person making these critiques, I know that for sure, um, but uh, these are my critiques from my experience. Um, and, uh, I've seen people echoing these critiques even in their first impressions videos. So I hope that they're able to take feedback because there's so much that I love about this, this game and the pawn system is so endearing and wonderful that I would love for it to be in a game that I could recommend without any hesitation. I love games that do weird stuff. 
I love the Souls games with all their weirdness. Um, I love Pathologic and Disco Elysium, these games that are weird and don't necessarily conform to the standards of, um, of you know, AAA games or what makes games good. But Dragon's Dogma 2, ironically, doesn't do enough of its own. It tries to be too many different things and it doesn't do them right. And as a result, its strong points actually get washed beneath the parts of it that just don't work that well. And it's really unfortunate. And there's stuff that they got rid of from Dragon's Dogma 1 that would have been really wonderful here and that would have felt nice and fun. More monster variety, uh, and it would have been great to bring back the quest board from Dragon's Dogma 1 where you're, like, given a quest to go hunt a certain type of monster a certain amount of times. That'd be cool to see. As it stands right now, Dragon's Dogma 2 is a very, very, very flawed game. And... While I do think that people could have a lot of fun with it, and I do think that it, even if you don't complete the game, you'll have fun with things like the pawn system and with the wackiness of the combat in the first, like, third to first half of the game. Um, it's If you play to the end, you're, you're going to be in for some disappointment. And just keep that in mind. Um, there is a lot to love. And I think I do love a lot of this game. But there's also so much frustrations that I felt myself getting more and more tired and angry the more that I played this game. And I don't really expect that I'll be revisiting it anytime soon, if ever. If they don't do a DLC, I can't imagine I'll ever go back and play Dragon's Dogma 2. But I will definitely be playing Dragon's Dogma 1 again. Um, so... With all that said, that is my exhaustive and complete review of Dragon's Dogma 2. Uh, I hope that you enjoyed it. I hope that you found it interesting. If you agreed with something that I said, let me know below. If you disagreed with stuff that I said, let me know below. I want to hear your thoughts. Leave me some comments. And of course, please make sure that you're subscribed down below to Demon Mama. Thanks for hearing the signal.